welcome to Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, I don't know how your day has been going thus far, uh, but uh, Lane is not going to be worship leader today because he's uh, rushing a horse uh, to the veterinarian in Scott's Bluff in an emergency, so uh, he's not here. and. Uh, some others are not here for various reasons. Uh, my morning is uh, we have a special stapler that staples the bulletins because uh, it has to go sufficiently far enough to get to the middle. And it jammed on me. And I spent, uh, oh, upwards about 35 minutes trying to get it fixed and workable again. Uh, so... You wonder just where God is in those moments. <laughs> yeah, but this is life. This is the way it is. This is how it comes to us. He is uh, fully present. There's nowhere where he is not. And yet it seems like there's some desert places where he isn't. Uh, at least that's how it hits me from time to time. Don't know about you. Uh, okay. Uh, announcements for deacon nominations, please give them to your fellow elder, uh, of which I'm the only one here. So uh, give it to me and remember to ask the person you nominate if they would like or choose to serve. Uh, I, I, I think you can get a good sense of what a deacon does by what they have been doing for us. Uh, some of it is behind the scenes or much of it. So you might want to talk to Carol or talk to Lee or Susan or Carolyn or so on and so forth and just see what it's like if you're interested. Self-nominating is also possible. It's not a, a, a strike against you. It's not an act of pride. Uh, in, indeed, uh, if, if we don't have any nominatings, I, I might be your next deaconess uh, or whatever. Uh, men can be nominated. I'm not trying to be funny here. It's a call to service and uh, reflecting the arms, hands, eyes, and heart of God in our midst and also in the community. So uh, having said that, there is a congregational meeting on January 28th or 29th, uh, uh, I better check my calendar here, but it's, the, it's immediately following worship on one of those days. Um, so, yeah, it's the uh, 28th, January 28th will be our congregational meeting. Um, and I hope you're in prayer for that. There, there is an open-ended part of that meeting. I know we bring food so that we don't dilly-dally and so on. But come with your, uh, what God has laid on your heart, uh, where uh, your contribution can be formally recognized in terms of uh, what you think God is or isn't doing and what we should or shouldn't be doing. We invite you all to participate. Even if you're not a member at this point, uh, listening would be uh, helpful to get the DNA of the church. Uh, if you are interested in being a member, just let me know and we will put that road together easily. Any other announcements? Yes. Um, Monday afternoon, we're going to use Bible study. We'll begin at 1.30, and uh, if there's any of you that haven't joined us before and would like to, and your schedule allows, please do so. We have plenty, plenty of books. The study will be on the book of James. And uh, for the Wednesday night study here, um, I believe that starts, uh, what did we decide on that? Uh, was it this coming Wednesday or a week from Wednesday? This Wednesday. This Wednesday? Okay. Because, uh, uh, so this Wednesday we restart the Wednesday night Bible study on uh, Ephesians there. Any other announcements or? Yes. 
downstairs. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, this coming Saturday, we're inviting any who have a cleaning gene, or not, to uh, come Saturday and help us clean. We have been doing some remodeling is not the right word, repair, uh, which involves some concrete. I just about didn't get my jacket off because there's so much dry cement in there, my zipper's not working. Uh, dust is everywhere. Uh, and so please come and uh, uh, that would be Saturday and we should make it bright and early, let's say 10 o'clock. No, when would we like to do it? I don't know. Uh, what works best for? Nine o'clock. Okay. And uh, so it'll just be wiping down. We'll have some tools to do walls and that kind of stuff. Uh, I did a little work up here uh, Saturday and downstairs just to keep it from looking too terrible, but it needs some TLC. Any other announcements? Just please come Saturday. S say what? Just please come Saturday. Yes, yes, please come. Please come. Oh yeah, when does that happen? Do we want to do both of those? At the, when do we usually do these? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Well, Saturday as well. Okay, so we'll do it all in one fell swoop here. Uh, if you're not into cleaning, maybe you're into demolition. Uh, so uh, you can take your pick. All right. Any other announcements? All right. Well, very good then. Um, as I mentioned, Lane is uh, transporting a horse to Scotts Bluff, so you're stuck with me. And let's then uh, stand and sing the introit joy has dawned. It is an, it's an insert there. Oh, boy.
continue with the Te Deum. We praise you, O oh God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. To you, cherubim and seraphim, continually do cry. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. Please be seated and join with me in spirit as we open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we are gathered here together in this rhythm of worship and we seek to know your wisdom. We seek to have your presence. We seek a glimpse into your beauty and we also seek a glimpse into the meaning of history. What, what, what was this process that you have taken the world through in which you dropped in Mary's womb a God-man? And Lord, all that preceded it and all that has followed it, how are we to see it? What, what, what does it all mean? And yes, the forgiveness of sins, that's the focal point. That's, the, that's your shout. That's the, the gospel or uh, good news. And, and we must start there. If we don't start there, we'll never finish where you want us to finish. And yet sometimes, Lord, forgiveness is just that easy, correct answer. And we, we bypass it so quickly because Christianity is so identified with it. Forgiveness, the shed blood. And yet, Lord, sometimes I think we, we really fail at that center heart of yours revealed in the gospel. Sometimes we, we, we don't grasp, we don't appropriate, we, we don't receive, we, we, we don't dwell, we, we don't experience the greatness of forgiveness. It's not just a starting point of the Christian life, it, it permeates it, it's, it's that which we must live in. And so, Lord, help us this morning to see it, to know it, to feel it, to apprehend it, to experience it, to let it define us. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's sing, praise him, praise him, uh, the other side of that insert.
Thank you, Richard. Those hymns are powerful musically, lyrically, and uh, other ways. Try singing them in the shower. Uh, let your heart sing. These things are wonderful. Sometimes I think traditionalists, which we're pretty much in terms of the flow of American Christian worship, pretty smack dab in the heart of it. Uh, sometimes we, we just argue for tradition. Uh, and we don't, again, as I mentioned in forgiveness, we, we fail to rest and to be nurtured and to be rejuvenated by that which we defend. Uh, hymns that are deep and moving and give us a picture of God's glory and his work. Um, yes, we need to not only affirm tradition, but experience it and let it form us and let us encounter it. That being said, confession, public confession can be wrote as well. I was talking to somebody who... She was uh, trying to explain to me how they celebrate Advent, but don't celebrate Advent. And I was just listening to her, and she began stumbling all over herself, trying to explain to me how they don't celebrate Advent, but, but, they, but they do celebrate Advent. And she, she was caught between a rock and a hard place because uh, uh, she didn't know quite how to express it. And I'm not criticizing her. I'm just saying that you can't not have tradition. Tradition exists because we exist. And if you have somebody shaking hands at the entrance, or if you have a greeter, or uh, if you have pews, or if you sit in a circle, or if you sit in a row, or if you allow jumping up and down, or you don't, clapping of hands, raising of hands, this is all part of what it means to form the tradition, and we have at the beginning of our bulletin a small t tradition filled with large t apostolic tradition. We could say it the other way around large t apostolic tradition filled with small t tradition. Uh, because God has created us as co creators, and uh, just like dressing yourself, so worship has an adornment to it and has an element of beauty and presentation to it. Um, so, yes, we can just say these words, or we can feel them. We can let them encounter us and define us, which is what I am suggesting. So let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is risen, and the Spirit has been given. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Most gracious God, our sins are too heavy, too real to hide, too deep to undo. Forgive us our tremble to name, that our hearts can no longer bear, and let us become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in the likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Amen. Too heavy to carry, too real to hide, too deep to undo, our pasts cannot be changed. So let's take these realities before God in a moment of personal reflection and confession. Now, brothers and sisters, hear his declaration of grace. This saying is true, and we should believe it, that Christ Jesus came into the world to rescue sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, 
that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. To all those who repent, therefore, I proclaim to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, and the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Bees and all livestock, creeping names and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up the horn for his people, praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and what's the big idea in that passage? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And we'll continue to do so with the reading of God's holy word. The first reading comes from Isaiah 61, verse 1, through 62, verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. 
All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For the earth brings forth its sprouts, as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night, they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes and makes it a praise in the earth. The word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Galatians. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. I mean that the, the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observed days and months and seasons and years I am afraid I have labored over you in vain. The word of the Lord. The Gospel reading comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter, 20, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. Hear the word of the Lord. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, 
waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came to the, in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. A sword shall pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years, from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption at Jerusalem. The return to Nazareth. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The word of the Lord. And let's stand and sing together our hymn, Jerusalem the Golden, number 208, in your binder.
And you may join with me in a spirit of prayer. Father God, we ask that you will be in our speaking and in our hearing and in our hearts meditation. In Jesus' name, amen. I talked with a salesman once who said, sales is, effective sales is all about sizzle, not substance. It's the smell and aroma of coffee. It's the smell and aroma of the steak. And I think what that person was trying to say is that we live mostly in the affective, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E. We live in desire. We live in that which propels and energizes. And there's debates on this in philosophy and theology throughout the years and so on and so forth. The church... Uh, for almost most of its existence, subscribed to some sort of an Aristotelian notion of the primacy of the intellect. The primacy of the intellect. Uh, the will is certainly needed, but the affect led you astray. It, the emotions were the the swirl of sin that needed to be in check all the time. Uh, it was seen in our day from Focus on the Family, James Dobson, when he wrote his book, uh, Feelings, Can You Trust Them? with a question mark. And his answer was unequivocally no. You see, that's the instability of humanity, is the, these emotions that we have. We quickly rise in hate, we, we rise in fear, we, we, we have things rise within us that, that, that are just like popcorn, popping, and uh, we, we must control them, uh, because if you don't, you can just get lost. And you can lose a sense of integration if you just let these emotions just rise and follow them, because we're, we're just basically a mess. And the will can do that. And the mind controls the emotions, and so on and so forth. There was one little phrase that I latched on to that I've remembered 50 years ago. The mind is the mill which grinds the food which feeds the heart. The mind is the mill which grinds the food, which feeds the heart. Is there a primacy in being human? Is the intellect the thing that controls everything else? Or is it the will? Or, with some minority in the history, is it passions? Have we, have we totally misconstrued emotion? And passion. Well, let me inform you of my wisdom. I don't know the answer to those questions. I think the, my best shot is that the heart is what Scripture speaks of regarding the Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. So what is the heart? My best take at it from Scripture is it's the composite of our mind and our will and our affect. It's that which makes us who we are. It's the integration self, the integrated self of those things that is the heart. So when we fear, that's not just an emotion that rises within us 
We fear because we are the integration of feelings and thoughts and will. That's who we are. We're defined holistically. And if you start dissecting us in a way that you separate those things, you don't have a human being. And so let's just first take a look at The Isaiah chapter 62, which is the second to the last page in your bulletin. And as you're turning there, I just want to highlight uh, Psalm 48, 148. You did get the right answer there. The, the big picture is praise the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord because he's our creator. He's created all of these things which the psalmist is telling them to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord the angels. Praise the Lord the, the host. Praise the Lord the sun, the moon, the shining stars. Uh, praise you the waters. Praise you uh, the creatures from all the, the deeps and the fire and the hail, the snow and the mist, the stormy wind fulfilling his word. Praise him, mountains and hills. So is Christianity pantheism? I mean, all these things, do they really praise the Lord? Is, is that what they do? You know, the, the big mystery was uh, when I used to shoot photography and I shot wildflowers, I, I would take a, 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 a hike off the beaten path and I would see this, this unbelievable brilliance of glory and beauty. And... Yes, I would be enamored, and I would stop, and I would shoot, and so on and so forth, but it crossed my mind. There must be a lot of these flowers out here that no one ever sees. What's their purpose? And, of course, we could respond on a twofold manner. God enjoys the beauty he created. They're for him. And he loves beauty, and that's why they're there in abundance, and that's why most flowers are never seen by the human eye. We're too caught up in going to the grocery market and doing our duty to enjoy the beauty and the grandeur of God. The other answer is that they praise God, that there's some sort of presence to all creation that is capable of praising God in some way, and I don't understand that. Some say that's just hyperbole and it's metaphor when Isaiah says, and the trees shall clap their hands and, 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 and so on and so forth. I don't know that that's true, that that's simply a metaphor. Jesus rebukes those who, who challenge his identity, and he says, if you won't praise me, I will raise these rocks up to praise me. Oh, just a metaphor. And they just yawned. Oh, more metaphors from this guy. No, I, I think there's something deeply mysterious about all creation, and all creation has been created to praise God. Now, we have, as image bearers, we are created in the likeness and image of God, unlike the rest of creation. Somehow you have to put that all together. So we're created to praise him. Now, we jump over to that passage in Isaiah chapter 62. And I want you to see some things here. You heard them. But I would like you to pause. I would like you to reflect. I want you to chew uh, these things, uh, grind these things, and so that you can digest them and, and enjoy them and have you experience them. Chapter 62 of Isaiah, verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet. Verse 2, the nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name. Now, in Scripture, we saw, did we not, that, that God expels man from the garden, and, and then there's the call and election of Abram, 
And then there's some altars, yes, that are uh, personal and that are commanded to be created. And then comes uh, the children of Israel in Egypt, and they're a people, and they're called Israel for the first time there as God extracts them from their slavery. And then he tells in detail how they are to build the tabernacle of God, which is God's tabernacling presence in and through Israel as a people. And then the tabernacle gives way to the permanence of the temple. And then that temple's destroyed, but first they're brought into the land, right? There's no place to build the temple. They first have to have a piece of land. And so, so God takes them into the land of Canaan. And he obliterates all inhabitants there because it's God's land. And he said, this is my chosen land for my chosen people. And he uh, creates a chosen city called Jerusalem. And he builds that chosen tabernacling presence, the temple. And then, of course, sin ensues and... That temple is destroyed and God's people are taken into another captivity, only this time into Assyria and then into to Babylon. All the while, the prophets warned them of that judgment that was to come. But there was always a glimmer of hope that, that, that God would restore, that God would renew, that, that God would be faithful to the promises he gave to Abram, Abraham. And this is where now the Christian Bible-believing people, they, they begin to separate in terms of just how this rolls out. There are some who, who see this promise uh, to Israel and, and the land and, and the temple as unfinished yet. Even after the second destruction of the temple, it's still unfinished. That temple is going to be rebuilt. That land is going to be rejuvenated in this kind of Eden-like language. And God's people... Israel will have a part in the last days of human history. And those typically come under the umbrella of dispensationalism. And then dispensationalism, like all the other isms, they have different clans, if you will, and what they emphasize and so on and so forth. But let me just, in the spirit of the EPC, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, and I've confirmed this with a well-respected dispensational friend of mine, that the end of the end of the end is one people in Christ in heaven. Right? Now, th there may be some differences in those chapters that get us there, but Bible-believing people believe that Jesus Christ is returning to this earth. And then what he does after that is a little bit up for debate. Some say he sticks around for a thousand years. Yeah, some say Jerusalem becomes the focal point where his reign and rule of the whole world for a thousand years takes place. And so Jerusalem finally gets her due. But if you just place yourself in this flow, this ebb and flow of history, it certainly wasn't that clear to them. I mean, the Passover, the celebration of deliverance from slavery and bondage in Egypt, was the highlight of, God, of Israel's defining historical moment. That's the Passover. It's still celebrated today in Israel. That's the defining identity of Israel as a people. God redeeming them. God with his right arm delivering them and bringing them into their land. And then, of course, it seems to grow. The, the, the mobile uh, 
temporary tabernacle gets a permanent dwelling place with the temple. And of course, that goes by the way of God's judgment. And then that second Herodian temple is built, which, which pales compared to the first temple. It's, it's not her glory. And yet Herod's temple was rumored and uh, certainly caught the ears of humanity in terms of its glory. But it was not and did not rise to the level of Solomon's temple. I don't know, maybe they were thinking there would be a big renovation. Well, I don't know. But certainly the end game of the temple and Jerusalem can't be inferior to any prior temple or any prior state of Jerusalem. It, 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 must, it, it must consummate, it, it must end somewhere, and that's where I've said that we all believe that there's one people in Christ in heaven. That's the end of the end of the end. So, I'm more covenantal than dispensational, and I think those types and shadows moved as an ebb and flow through history until the destruction of that second temple in which God says, okay, the reality now has come. This is the defining moment in history. What is what? It's the babe. It's the little God-man who came out of the, the womb in the vaginal canal of Mary. That's the defining, beginning, inauguration of the end of the end. It's the greatest moment in history. Bar none. Now, you can't really separate that from the resurrection. I get that. You can't separate it from the ascension, and you can't separate it from the coronation. I get all of that. But Paul's focus was the cross. The cross did something. After the God-man was born, the cross was the defining moment of God's visitation. He took care of our sin. And all of the renewing promises that was in the prophets regarding the land, regarding Jerusalem, regarding the temple, they have as their fulfillment Jesus the Christ. Ultimately, in the end of the end of the end, and I think as a covenant theologian, in a defining way in the new covenant with the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And what did that give us? Well, I think it's found here in chapter 62. Jerusalem's sake. God's focus is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the righteousness shall go forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations are going to see your righteousness and you shall be called by a new name. See, all of this verbiage is found in Revelation. It's the end of our Bible in which Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. And God says there won't be any need for a sun or moon anymore because Jesus is going to be our light. Now we can't take that overly woodenly. Otherwise we can't see Jesus or we would be blind. Of course, we'll have resurrected bodies, and so it'll be different. But you see how it's somehow fulfilled in Jesus himself. God's Jerusalem, I believe, is his people. It's you, and it's me, in Christ. The defining moment in human history. And why do I say that? Verse 3. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. When did that happen? The deliverance from uh, Egypt? Yeah, kind of. Uh, what about the return from Assyria and Babylon after the second exile? Yeah, kind of. And yet... Not really. We, we see where, where uh, uh, Ezekiel sees as the return from Assyria and Babylon in which 
God raises up Cyrus and decrees that the Jews can return. And Ezra says this is the fulfillment of the glorious prophecy found in the Hebrew Scriptures. What's happening? Ah, oh, the return, the glory, oh, the rejuvenation. And yet the return was like the second temple. They got started on the walls. A small portion of them returned, but it fizzled. Ah, oh, but you say they came back. They did. And they erected a temple that was lackluster to the solemn temple, temple of Solomon. So, so it's still not seeming to happen. The number of people didn't come back. Uh, the, uh, uh, the land had not been totally rejuvenated with an abundance of crops. Um, but most fundamentally, because of the yet third exile and judgment of God, the heart never got changed. The heart never got changed. And that's the fundamental problem of Israel, which is a type of you and me. Our hearts need to be changed. No amount of plant return, no amount of green grass, no amount of glory with gold and silver and all of the, uh, the precious jewels of the temple can do it. It must come from within, and it comes from within because we are the temple of God. His work is within our hearts by His Spirit. That's where it has come into fulfillment now, is we are in Christ. We are in the true temple, and there's no more temple to be built. That's where I lean, but others see it differently. And what's the product of seeing it in a covenantal way? Well, as I said, no more termed forsaken. Your land shall no more be desolate. Now, if, if those are shadows of reality, what, what, what does it mean to be forsaken? Well, we have to just look on the cross, God's judgment, and we fear it, don't we? We, we fear our past. Uh, who, who can raise their hand here and say, I have no closets in my life? None. Uh, matter of fact, you could open my book, the story of my life. I wouldn't even be embarrassed. Is that you? I don't think so. Not if I understand Scripture correctly. So what does it mean to be desolate and forsaken? It means to fear God's judgment. And God's judgment was fully fulfilled on the cross. This is why we don't enjoy forgiveness. This is why we pick fights and we have bickerings and, and, and why we can't uh, get uh, people to sign up to clean the church and do this and do that, you know, because uh, th th this is w where we're at. We're, we're, we're not stopping and experiencing what? The second half of verse 4. But you shall be called, my delight is in her. In your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. You see, this is what the reformers, or our tradition, often fails to do. To enjoy the glorious truth that we preach and teach. It's like no wedding night in a marriage. And you show up the next day, oh, it's great. Yeah, we're married. Yeah, we're married. God's end goal has arrived in an inaugurated way. And you have now 
exchange your forgiveness and your desolateness with God's favor and his delight. You are married. You have a land that is blossoming. All the fruit is in abundance, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's all yours in the spirit. And if you're like me, your response is, praise God, but man, do I need a work in my heart, because I just am not there a lot of times. I, I'm so, sometimes, I, I ponder studying the scripture or praying or, or something, and it's just so much easier to turn on Netflix. No, maybe, maybe that's not you. Maybe you don't have a subscription to Netflix. Well, I don't know what it is, but God in my heart sometimes is an overwhelming, I find an overwhelming disinterest in my being. And then I'm scared again. I'm scared of God's judgment. I'm scared of being desolate. And there's that rhythm of worship and growing in the knowledge of God. I, I, I need to go back. Where? To the cross. Not, not I, I don't need to plumb the depths of my motives. God, when I do that, I'm a mess. I don't know what my motives are much of the time. And if you think you do, I would just ask you to read Scripture and, and see if that comports with what Scripture portrays us as. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Rhetorical question. Answer, none of you. Not me, not you, not presidents, not kings, not royalty, not the best person you think of, none of us. Our hope, brothers and sisters, is back to where our forsakenness truly is satiated, where God's righteousness and his demands have been fulfilled and his judgment has been reached and consummated. This delight and this marriage metaphor continues. God seems to just want to stay with it. Verse 5, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall you rejoice in God. That's not what it says, does it? This is what we lack. If there's something that we lack, it's here. So shall your God rejoice over you. Oh, there's so much metaphor of bride and groom, and Jesus is our groom, yes, and we are his bride, and we must respond to his overtures, and there's a dance, there's a relational dance that's meaningful and brings great joy, and, and we're striving for it, but the end here, the foundation of all of that, is that God has satisfied his judgment and God has given us his righteousness and now he rejoices over you and me. How can that be? Me, the duplicitous Nate Johnson, who, who turns on Netflix when God in his glory is before me and I just want to veg and... Just be numb for a while. Now that's not to say escapism and entertainment's wrong. It's not. But, but I wonder sometimes where my heart is. I, I, I wonder where its passionlessness comes from. And I, I wonder what it all means. And, and then I can get lost in my own subjectivity. I have to go back to the fact that God rejoices over me. God truly loves me. My closets, all those things that I fear and that I would be embarrassed and shamed with, he, he still loves me because he has forgiven me.
that's why you walked in these doors. At least that's what the Spirit wants you to come into these doors for, is to experience and to enjoy the fact that you are forgiven. And not just the fact, but the experience of it, that he rejoices over you. He rejoices over me. And if that's not all, on verse 6, and on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation, no trial that, that can overtake you, but that God hasn't provided a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Those are his watchmen over your life. Why? Because he rejoices over you and he loves you. He's got your back. He's got your front. He's got your sides. You know, the, 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 the big famous movie, Top Gun. Don't ever leave your wind, man. God never leaves his wind children. Amen. Ever, anywhere, no how. Now, that doesn't mean you toss out your sense and feelings of guilt. Feelings of guilt are a wake-up call. It's just that the resolution is not found in you, but in what God has done in Christ. Now there's watchmen over you in terms of the structure of the church as well. Day and night, they should never be, they should never be silent. They put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. Now my dispensational brothers and sisters might be right. There might be a more glorious Jerusalem on its way. But we agree that the end of the end and the end of the end is that in Revelation, God takes his bride and it says that he gives each a new name by giving them a stone. And the only people who know that name is the receiver and the giver. It's not going to be Nate. It's going to be that name that, that drives home God's delight in me because of his son. It's not going to be Kim. It's not going to be Huey. It's not going to be Scott or Meg. Or I can go through all. I'll be challenged because my brain freezes when I'm under pressure. But, you know, y'all are you. <laughs> that stone's coming. He's going to give it to you. But you're solid in Christ now. You have the deposit now. What is that deposit? It's him. That's what the tabernacle and the temple were all about. It's his presence in the midst of his people. Only now he's given you his spirit. And that deposit, get this now, it's fulfillment, the not yet, is the same kind as the deposit. It's not something new and different. We're not going to all get, sorry Mary Kay, pink Cadillacs in heaven. That's not the prize of the prize. It's the greater experience of his presence, and so we'll never, ever doubt again God's nearness to us. And I pray that you will pause and let yourself be in that presence that's now yours because, because of his spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. I think we're going to have to skip a few things. But I love our doxology, so if we can start, stand, and let's sing together the doxology uh, found on the bottom of page three in your bulletin. Let's just stop and praise him for who he is and what he has done. He's God from
seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. On the night that our Lord was betrayed during the Passover feast, which celebrated God's right arm of deliverance and redemption through the shedding of blood, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same manner, he took the cup of blessing. And when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it all of you in remembrance of me. Body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. I'm not going to be here. Let's just use our imagination. Herb's not here. Lane's not here. But the Christ candle is here. What about those closets? When Jesus said, you need to pray and forgive people. How many times, Lord? Seven? Seven times 70. In a day? Wow. That seems really silly. Sometimes Jesus speaks one way and he means it for another. Minimally, I think in that 7 times 70, what he means by that is that we will be haunted by this desolate forsakenness that we falsely perceive God to be upon us, and we need to come back to him 70 times 7 in repentance and cry out for mercy. And so bring your closets, bring that sin that you would never share with anybody because it's too shameful to have. And you wonder if you really can be forgiven, just bring it here because he's already forgiven it. This is part of your 70 times 7. Pick up the bread, dip it, and receive from him the presence that he's already given you and promised you in Christ. Come.
and receive his nearness. Let's stand and sing our exiting hymn, which is printed in your bulletin on um, second to the last page. And the title on what has now been sown. What has God given us? Let us sing.
I'm going to give you the benediction from Numbers chapter 6, which is all too familiar to us, but it shouldn't be, but it is, because it's the most common one, and we just rattle it off our tongues and let it sink into our ears as if it goes in one ear and out the other. But I'm asking you to pause, I'm asking you to be intentional, I'm asking you to find God's work deep in your soul, the affect and the mind and the will, and let it blossom fruit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And now I will attach to this Matthew Henry's statement fitting for the new year. Firmly believing that my times are in God's hand, I here submit myself and all my affairs for the ensuing year to the wise and gracious disposal of God's divine providence. Go in the strength, the beauty, the richness, the wonder of God's grace in Christ. Thank you for coming and have a happy and safe New Year's Eve.